enough not to get into a lot of fights with each other. We do get into tips, like everybody else, you know, you live with somebody under the same roof, you're going to get on each other's nerves, that happens, but as far as those, like, you know, just drag out, brawl kind of fights, you know what I'm talking about, we don't really have those. And, and even the few times that we have, they've not been over serious things. Most of them are over pretty stupid things, really. One of our most memorable fights was who was going to get the last Oreo in the package. And that sounds dumb, but it gets worse because there was another package of Oreos in the house. This fight was all about that particular cookie and what that cookie represented as a symbol, right? We get into dumb fights. Another one of our, our more memorable fights came early on in our marriage when we were in college when we were playing a video game together, Call of Duty. We were on the same team. We had a shared objective. And apparently I had been a little too bossy in how I was laying out the game plan for how we would achieve victory. And she didn't like it. So the countdown started. Three, two, one, go. And we were off. My character took three steps forward. And then I watched him fell to the ground and the screen turned red. And I was dead because she shot me in the back. <laughs> and I said, you shot me? She says, I know. I said, why? We're all on the same team. She said, I like the way you're talking to me. <laughs> that was one of our more memorable fights, and it's a precursor to it. Like, we fight over dumb stuff. We don't fight over things that matter. And if you were to look at some of the fights in your life, with either your spouse, your, your neighbor, your family, your friends, whoever, if you were to really take stock of the things that you fought over, I'm willing to bet that a number of those things would be stupid fights that really don't make any difference and are inconsequential. We fight over silly things. We pick all the wrong fights. But not every fight is wrong. Not every fight is silly or, or stupid. A lot of times there are fights in this world that matter and that make a big difference in the name of good and in the name of God in a lot of people's lives. This fight for equal treatment amongst people is a fight worth fighting. That makes a lot of difference, and it has made a lot of difference throughout history in this world. A fight to protect the innocent from injustice and persecution and so on. That's a fight that makes a big difference to a lot of people. Like, some of these fights do matter. So I guess the question we have to ask ourselves from time to time is, which fight am I picking? Am I picking one of the fights that don't matter, or am I picking a fight that makes a big difference in this world? That's the question we're going to grapple with this morning as we wrap up our series, Love Does. For the last five weeks, we've been going through this series about the nature of love, and over and over again, you've heard it said, love is not something merely content to be received, or experienced, or felt. Love doesn't sit on the sidelines. Love in its deepest core yearns to be expressed and shown and, in a word, done. That's where the name love does came from. And this morning, we're going to look at what love does to the fights that we pick in our lives. Now, like I said, we oftentimes pick the wrong fight. It's easy to do, but that's not a, a problem that is just unique to us in our day and age. This is something that people have struggled with for a long, long time. We have a long and storied history of picking the wrong fights. And even Jesus had to deal with this in his own life. People were constantly trying to suck him into the wrong fight. For instance, there's this story early on in his ministry in the book of Luke, in chapter 12, where Jesus is preaching to this crowd, and this guy comes up to him, and listen to what this guy says. He says in verse 13, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge and arbiter between you? So this guy comes up to Jesus and immediately tries to suck him into his family feud. Jesus, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. Now this could have been property, it could have been money, it could have been any number of things. But at the end of the day, he's trying to suck Jesus into this fight about stuff. Things. And if you notice, Jesus doesn't want any part of it. Man, who appointed me a judge between you? This is the wrong fight, and Jesus recognizes it. But today, we still oftentimes we get sucked into this wrong fight over stuff and over things, whether it be money, property, possession, whatever. I mean, in my own neighborhood right now, there's kind of this squabble happening. I have a neighbor in the neighborhood who, for years, had this fence that went into their neighbor's yard and went over the property line, and they 
planting plants there. But the guy who lived next door, he didn't really care. Like, he was less than mow, so he was cool with it. But then a new guy bought that house, and he does care quite a bit about that property line. And so he took that fence, and he took all those plants, and he kept them. Much to the chagrin of my current neighbor. And so there's been discussions, heated arguments, unkind things have been said, the police have gotten involved, like it's kind of a, a big fight, and at the end of the day, it's all about stuff. We get pretty attached to our stuff. Even my two-year-old son, Levi, is attached to stuff. We were sitting on the couch the other day eating a snack bag of chips, you know, if you put your, your kid's lunchbox. And I would eat a chip, and he would eat a chip, and eventually just crumbs at the bottom of the bag, and so I just dumped them on my mouth. And he would have thought I shattered his whole world. No, no, mine! Mine! No, no! Like, he's attached to stuff. We never really grow out of it. And a lot of times our attachment to things, it leads us to pick the wrong fight. But this isn't the only thing we fight about. You know, sometimes we fight about the tangible. Sometimes we fight about the intangible. We fight about feelings. And there's one feeling in particular that has led us into so many of these wrong fights. We're talking about pride. Our, our ego, our sense of self-importance, or our sense of self-significance. Man, how many of us have been dragged into a fight because we dug our heels in the ground and somebody bruised our pride, right? Look, I got two honest people in the room. Must be nice to have a room full of angels. I know I have. And people try to suck Jesus into these kind of fights as well. There's this, his own disciples even, towards the end of his life, Luke 22, verse 24, this is what it goes on. It says, A dispute also arose among them, being his disciples, as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Let's just pause for a second and imagine how that conversation went, what that argument was like. I'm the greatest. No, I'm Jesus' favorite disciple. No, he loves me more. Like, I, I don't know how else this could have unfolded, but no matter how you slice it, this is kind of an egotistical and ridiculous argument of that. I think about this. And Jesus doesn't want any part of it. Listen to what he says. It says, Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors, meaning everybody else in the world is out to get theirs, everybody else is concerned about power and authority and ego. And he goes on, But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest. The one who rules like the one who serves. Jesus was no part of this fight over ego and pride and, and who's the most significant and most important. But so many times we can easily get dragged into these because somebody offends us or somebody bruises our ego. There was this conflict uh, several decades ago between Argentina and Chile, those nations, to share a border. And this was a pretty significant fight, but eventually they made peace. But when I say that, I mean, they made enough peace to stop fighting each other. And in honor of that peace, they built a statue on the border between the nations. It's this statue. It's called Christ of the Andes. And you would think this statue of Jesus, the peacemaker, standing between your two nations would serve as the symbol of how dumb this fight was. But, but the anger didn't subside. In fact, the Chileans, they saw the statue and they started to get angry again. They started to protest, and tempers started to flare, and they were ready to fight all over again. And here's why. It's because when Jesus' statue was built, and he was built facing Argentina, and his back was turned to Chile. Why should they get Jesus' face if we just get the behind? Why can't we see Jesus' face? Why can't he look over us? This is an outrage. Can you imagine fighting over which direction a statue faced? But this is what caused these tempers to flare. There's findings, there's one clever newspaper man, he kind of put the kibosh on the whole squabble, because he printed this. He said, don't worry about it. The Argentinians, they just need more looking after than we do. That's why Jesus faces that way. Right? And they were all kind of able to laugh at it. But this is what I'm talking about. Pride. Our ego. Our sense of self-importance and self-significance can lead us into some of the dumbest fights. These are the wrong fights to pick because they don't really accomplish anything. But this isn't even the dumbest kind of fight we get into. Probably the worst culprit here it is a fight over this simple question. Who's right and who's wrong? How many of you have gotten into a fight over the question of who's right and who's wrong? Who 
Who's got the facts straight? Who's correct in this situation? We live in a day and age where it is so easy to fact check anything that anyone says. Where we can push up our glasses and say, well, actually, let me, let me correct you there. And we can just we almost get this sense of pleasure out of proving somebody wrong. And I have not inoculated to this. I have struggled with this for years. There's this one story. Uh, I was years ago in a different church. And I was preaching there. And afterwards, I was talking to this 80-something-year-old lady. That's what she saw in the news. It's about the restaurant Chick-fil-A. The, the chicken place. The best chicken in the world. So anyway, I talked to her about Chick-fil-A. And it took me forever to figure out what she was talking about. Because she kept calling it Chick-fil-A. <laughs> And I was, I was trying to piece it together, and finally I caught it, I said, do you, oh, do you mean to say Chick-fil-A? She said, no, Chick-fil-A. I said, no, Alice is pronounced Chick-fil-A. She said, no, I've seen signs, Chick-fil-A. And that right there was this moment, like, it could have been a tumbleweed that moved by, and like this kind of like gunslinger moment where I wanted to dig in my heels and be like, no, madam, you are objectively wrong. Look at the sign, it's Chick-fil-A. But I didn't because I've learned that, that is, these are dumb fights that don't accomplish much of anything. And even Jesus, he got roped into some of these fights as well. He's people trying to go through it. There's a story in Luke 20 where Jesus is preaching. In verse 1, it says, One day as Jesus was teaching, the people in the temple courts were proclaiming the good news. The chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us by what authority you're doing these things. They said, Who gave you this authority? They're basically saying, Jesus, how do you know we got your back straight? How do you know that, that you're saying the right things? Who gave you your permit? Who, who gave you these credentials? It's a, it's a conflict over who's right and who's wrong. And again, Jesus has no interest in this fight. If you keep reading that story, he gives him an explanation that kind of just disarms the whole scenario. I mean, we see this again and again in his life, too. People try to rope him into these dumb fights and dumb arguments, all the wrong fights. And time and time again, he refuses to take part of it. And he disarms the situation. And a lot of it has to do with the weapon that he chose to wield. He chose to act in love. And that's probably another point we ought to hit on this morning. Not only do we often pick the wrong fights, a lot of times we try to wield the wrong weapons too. I mean, just think back to those stories that we heard, all, all of them, just for a minute. But think about the weapons that people use trying to win that fight. That fight about stuff, for instance. People use their words, they use anger, they use the legal system, all in an attempt to win this fight. Or that fight about pride, ego, Argentina and Chile, outrage, protest, those were the weapons. Or that fight about who's right, who's wrong, me and Lady that you play, you know, stubbornness, even facts at times can be used as weapons. And you know as well as I do, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Because people can use power, they can use influence, they can use money, they can use relationships, all as leverage, all as weapons to try and win a fight or win an argument, not realizing that weapon is wounding people in the process. We try to fight these wrong fights with the wrong weapons. And even faith at times can be used as a weapon. There's a story from a guy named Bob Goff. Bob's a guy we've heard a lot of in this series. He's an attorney, and in his early days as a mediating attorney, he met these two gentlemen, Christian men, to whom concepts like mercy and grace and forgiveness just seemed foreign and alien. And these two men, they had this conflict, and Bob can tell very early, it was a deep-running conflict with a long and storied history. There's a lot of pain there. But instead of dealing with that and practicing things like mercy and grace and forgiveness, they just wanted to spit Bible verses at each other like bullets from a machine gun. Just boom, 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 boom. All in an attempt to try and gain this moral high ground. And the whole thing disgusted Bob so much that he finally came to the point where he rented a boxing ring and a referee. And he said, look, conversation's not working, so we're actually going to fight here. Here's the time, here's the day, winner take all. And in his mind, Bob was thinking, no matter who wins, I get the winner because I'm ready to damn them both. He was just fed up. So the day the fight came, Bob had sneakers on, his gray sweatsuit. He had a towel rolled up around his neck because that's what we saw in the movie Rocky. And he just waited. And the guys never showed. They were more interested in fighting than they were in resolution. Their faith didn't really mean a whole lot. It was just another weapon that he wielded in the conflict. We use 
all the wrong weapons when we take part in these wrong fights. But that's not what we see Jesus doing. In fact, when he does choose to address conflict or enter into a fight, he does it with a whole different mentality and a whole different weapon in his hand. He uses love to disarm the situation. In the book of Matthew, chapter 18, there's this conversation he has with Peter, one of his disciples. In verse 21, this is how the conversation goes. It says, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. And when Jesus says seventy-seven times here, realize he's not saying, keep a tally, and when they get to seventy-eight, cut them off, because that's one too many. But rather, seven in Hebrew thought, this was his number of completion. Which meant that if Peter is saying, should I forgive them seven times, he, he is asking, should I show them just this complete, this, this overwhelming sense of grace? Forgive seven times, and Peter thought it was just this abundant display of forgiveness, but Jesus says, no. Forgive them seven times, and then keep on forgiving. Don't ever stop showing that person forgiveness and grace and mercy and love. You know, he, he, don't, don't take aim with your tongue. Don't brandish anger like a singer by which you strike people down. But rather, with love, disarm and win this fight better before it ever starts. Love was his weapon there. Again, later in Jesus' life, towards the end, we read in Matthew chapter 26, the situation where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying. And these soldiers, they come to arrest him, and Peter draws a literal weapon, a sword. And this is what Jesus says. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to them. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. You think I cannot call the Father and he will at once put my souls in more than 12,000 angels? But how then would the, descript the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? In other words, he's saying, Peter, this isn't a fight. This is not the fight I'm interested in. If I wanted to enter this fight, if I wanted to win this fight, I could. And I could muster a weapon beyond anything these guys could even comprehend. I could win hands down easily, but I'm not going to because this isn't the fight I'm called to. And Jesus would be arrested as a result of this and he'd be crucified. Which under any other circumstance would sound like a defeat, but in this particular instance, it was his victory. Because the fight that God had called him to was something so much more than just standing in front of crowds and preaching. The, the fight was something so much more than protecting stuff or pride or, or showing who's right and who's wrong, who's got the back straight and who doesn't. The fight was for people. The fight was for you and me and our soul, for our eternity, for our affections, for our loyalties, for our love. And all that cross when Jesus died, all that sin, that shame, all that disgrace, as Brian did so eloquently earlier, was obliterated. It was wiped away. And we were left standing there clean and pure and new. We were made children of God, brought into His family, to be loved and to love others. That's what was accomplished that day. That was the victory. That's what this whole fight was all about. And love was the only weapon capable of winning that war. That's why Jesus didn't get caught up in the wrong fights and use the wrong weapons. There was something bigger that God had called him to. And that brings us to that last point we've got to hit on today. Because as we've said, we've talked a lot about the wrong fights, the dumb fights that we get into. But not every fight is wrong and not every fight is dumb. In fact, there are fights in this world that God calls us to pick. God calls us to take a stand and to fight and love is the only weapon that will win these battles. I mean, we can waste our time and our life fighting over things that are inconsequential and ultimately can make very little difference in the world. Or we can choose to fight the fights that God himself has picked. To fight these fights for the people that grieve the heart of God because of their suffering, because of their shame, because of their slavery, to sin and death. This is the fight that God has called us to. We read about some of them in James chapter 1, verse 27. He says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after widows and orphans in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And that last statement, keep oneself from being polluted by the world, that, that is a whole other sermon in and of itself, and we will hear some other time. But this morning, just to stay focused on our topic, I look at that first part. This is religion that God our has pure walls to look after widows and orphans in their need. The truth is that there are vulnerable people in society. And when I say society, I don't mean cities that are far away. 
by our flow, I mean like in our own community, in Monmouth, there are vulnerable people here for whom God's heart breaks. We have a lot of immigrants in our community that have come to this country to look for work just simply to better their lives. And yet, oftentimes, we pretend they're not there or we don't really give them a second thought. But the reality is they're, they're working hard to navigate complicated political waters and just to figure out how to fit into this culture that's very different from their own. They, they need a lifeline. They need somebody to stand beside them. They need somebody to fight for them. Not with anger and outrage and protest, but just with, with a helping hand, with a kind word, with an embrace. We have a lot of elderly in our community. And not all of them have family who live nearby to, to care for them and spend time with them. And a lot of times then they go neglected, stuck in a facility somewhere. And we got to ask ourselves, as people who strive to please our God, who's fighting for them? And again, it's not a fight that takes place with outrage and protest or, 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 or trying to use the legal system. It's a fight that takes place simply by giving them our time and our affection, praying with them, reading scripture with them, encouraging them. We have a drug problem in our community. It's not a secret. And that problem affects a lot of people on a lot of different levels, but those that are most impacted are the children and users who suffer neglect to various degrees and various kinds. And if we're to be people who have a religion that is pure and flawless in the eyes of our God, we have to ask who fights for them. Who encourages them? Who gives them a kind word? Who gives them a smile? Who helps them make sure they get to school okay? It's all okay. There are fights in our own backyard worth picking. And I don't say it is to try and guilt us or browbeat us or anything like that. I simply want to raise the issue and hopefully we step back and take a look at who lives next door. Who lives across the street? Who really lives in our community because these are people who God loves, who God chases, who God pursues, who Jesus came to this world and died to save that they might know a life where none of this junk exists. That's the fight that we are called to take arms in. And our arms are not well wishes and love from a distance. Our weapons are the kind of up-close love that God has shown us. The kind of love that embraces, that serves, that cares for, that extends a hand, that welcomes, that greets. That is what love does. And all this other junk, these fights about stuff, fights about ego and pride, fights about who's right, who's wrong, all of this other stuff is just a smoke screen, okay? It's a distraction. And we have to be diligent enough to see it because we do have an enemy. And it's not the people who mess with our stuff, who, who wound our pride. The book of Ephesians, chapter 6, this is what it says, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord. Um, text messages just pop up. I love technology, but it makes sense sometimes. Finally, be strong in the Lord, and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. Let's just pause here for a minute. Devil's schemes. What's a scheme? It's a plan. Is it not? It's a plan in which deception is involved. And guys, we are the ones to whom he seeks to deceive. We are to put on the full armor of God so we can take our stand. Because our struggle, our fight, is not against flesh and blood. Just pause there, because that's a, a big incredible statement. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. That means that those people that mess with our stuff, that's not our enemy. Those people that have wound our pride and, and our sense of self-significance, they are not the enemy. Those people who, who may not have the facts straight, who have a different way of thinking, who have a different worldview, who worship a different God, those people are not our enemy. They are not where the fight lies. Our fight is not against flesh and blood but against the authorities, the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We do have an enemy, but it's not the guy over next door. It's not the girl across the street. It's not the people that cut us off in traffic. We have an enemy that seeks to prowl this world and devour the vulnerable like a lion. We have an enemy who deceives, who seeks to steal people away from the heart and love of God. We have an enemy, and that's where the fight is. And it would just be amazing for him if God's people became so distracted fighting the wrong people with the wrong fights, using the wrong weapons, that they forgot all about what's really going on in this cosmic conflict between good and evil, between God and Satan, between death and life. And church, we cannot.
cannot afford to make that mistake. We have a fight. It's a fight that God has called us to. It's a fight in which we brandish love and we bring healing and encouragement and kindness and patience as we serve, as we embrace, as we share the gospel with those who need to hear it because these are mistakes. Not who's right, who's wrong. Not whose stuff is protected. Not whose ego is bolstered. Who knows Christ lives forever and who doesn't? The church has to fight. And the love compels us to make that our conflict. Love compels us to make our stand and to join this battle that God is fighting, that He has rescued us because of, to take our place in the gospel story and be who God has called us to be. That's what love does, church. And this morning, I want you to know that if you have not accepted that gospel story, that good news of Christ who has rescued you from death itself and given you new life and made his child, you can make that change today. But it's a change that only you can choose. And if it's a choice and a step that you're ready to make in your life because you feel God calling to you, pulling on your heart strings, I want you to take the connection card out of the back of the seat in front of you. On the back is our next steps for you the very top of a, a white circle with a little white cross in it and it says choose Christ and I would urge you to make that choice today. To choose Christ. To choose God's love. To choose God's promise. To choose to be a child of the family of God. For the rest of us who already made that choice I want to ask that we just simply join the fight. That we take our stand that we forget about all this other deception and schemes and we focus on the battle that God's called us to. And that we don't fight the conventional weapons of anger and protest and argument take, but rather we simply use what God has equipped every single one of us to do, to love. And I know that you can love because you have experienced tremendous love in the gospel of Jesus. You know what it looks like. It's going to be light box. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for fighting for us. We thank you for your love, for your healing grace, for the promise that we have in Jesus. Father, we thank you that you have equipped us to take our stand against the devil's schemes, that you give us all the knowledge that we might need, that you give us all the gifting we might need. And Lord, I just pray that you would have the courage to join the fight, to trust you and what you're calling us to do, to love you, to honor you, and serve you by serving others and loving on others. Father, use us to make a difference and show us what love does. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.